baseline. So we've started the recording again. That's excellent. Just going to have a quick look down the people list. I think we're probably good. OK, so I think we're all back. Ready to rock. So we are now going to go to item number eight um, and I'll ask Boyd to come in and speak to this. So this is our corporate risk register. So I will hand over to you, Boyd. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, the risk paper today is to provide the board with assurance that the risks currently held on the board risk register are at being actively managed through your appropriate executive leads and governance committees within NHS Highland. And to give an uh, status late status review uh, of these individual risks. Um, it continues as a risk register to be refreshed in line with Together We Care, um, looking to align the direction in the strategy with the risks that describe trying to get there. Um, for the May 24 risk um, paper, we would expect to refresh to be more in line with our risk appetite approach and strategic transformation programs, which are now launching. And um, the way forward for risk has been agreed um, through the FRPC. Um, we look to also include the original score and the score with mitigations um, as we develop processes for decision making and reviewing. Um, the um, executive directors group uh, maintains the risk register and reviews it regularly. Content of the risk register will be informed by the input from uh, the executive directors group, senior leadership teams, governance committees and the board. So all the risks in the risk register have been mapped to the governance committees of NHS Highland so that they uh, can there be uh, get the oversight and scrutiny and management of the risks and an overview of the strategic risks is presented to the board on a bi-monthly basis. The audit committee is responsible for ensuring that we have appropriate risk management processes in place. Uh, so um, this, this summary paper then presents the overview of the risks identified as belonging to the NHS Highland Strategic Risk Register uh, as housed on DATEX. So with that, Chair, um, and maybe uh, I, I shall pause perhaps for um, the board to comment or ask questions. That's great. Thank you, Boyd. OK, uh, any questions or comments for Boyd? No, I mean, I, I have a question, but I suppose actually this is maybe where I will be admitting that I do not do, know all of the level two risk registers off by heart. Um, and it was a question about where we capture or hold risk around contractors. Um, and, and maybe you broaden that out wider to kind of other sectors, but I'm imagining that that could sit under the the kind of the partnership risk registers, but actually I don't know if there's something more broad. And I'm thinking about contracts in the broadest sense, so including um, independent GP practices. Um, and I don't know where that risk is held. And I, maybe I've seen it, but I just can't remember. Um, um, Pam's got her hand up. Oops, sorry. Yep, yeah, Pam. Um, <clears throat> thanks. Um, just to, to provide assurance in the process, then we do hold a number of um, risks at level two and level three across the, the partnership. So primary care um, services um, being, um, you know, fully part of that. And we also um, report regularly to the Health and Social Care Committee um, and we provide assurance through that committee around the, the risks that, that we have. Um, we also have a monthly um, risk monitoring meeting within the partnership where we review all of the risks and make sure that the mitigation is correct and that they've all been reviewed and updated accordingly. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Chair, Chair, it may be helpful to consider that um, best practice as we go forward, we would aim um, to have risks being um, expressions of things that haven't happened but may uh, occur to get in the way of delivering on the outcomes uh, that are intended. So 
at board strategic level. Obviously, that'd be that'd be quite high level, but um, we'll seek to um, create a risk register where you can see some of that in action. The specific that you asked is likely um, to be within um, probably more so expressed in the deliverables or around the whole procurement and contracting processes that sit within the various operational parts of the organization as well as corporately and the um the procurement will be of x you know a product or a service but the risk will be if there's a a variation in the contract or a problem so the risks will probably appear but there'll be things that hopefully aren't things that will happen or become issues but rather be things to mitigate against and so there may be many risks that already are well mitigated against um, when it comes to procurement and contracting. Thanks. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I suppose that that was a a, a reflection on um, some discussions that I'd had locally and, and understanding the pressures um, that many of our contractors are facing. And I suppose the, the fragility that that may present in the future. Um, but absolutely understand what you've just described there. Um, OK, Alex, I'll bring you in next. Yeah, thanks for that, boy. No, that, that makes a lot of sense in terms of, you know, we've had the issue before about is it a risk, is it an issue? So what you've just described is fine for, for, for looking forward. The bit that still concerns me a little, and I know it's an issue just now, but it's more a case of how we move it forward in the future, is the issue about dentistry and dental services within the Highland area particularly in as much as NHS dentists, and I know of two or three in my own area that are going more onto the private side rather than into the NHS side. Is that something that we need to look at in terms of, of risk to our population um, as much as the service that we provide? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think we're bringing um, an overarching strategic clinical risk. Um, I, I think the best way to look at this from a board level risk register is not to get into the sink because if you have a risk around if dentistry is a service that you're mentioning we actually have a hundred plus services we could then say there's a risk with that something will happen with each of them we, we would end up with our top highest level strategic risk register being populated with 100 risks um, so looking to retain the high level strategic at this reg risk register, but making sure that uh, people are looking at the risks within the services at the various levels and places they need to. For dentistry, if you use that as an example, there are things that are presently uh, occurring and they are actually issues. They're no longer risks. It isn't that they might happen, they have happened, they are happening. Um, that said, there are also national uh, elements to dental services. And it's hard for us to hold risks that are actually about the national contracting arrangements or the national configuration of services in Scotland. And so um, it it is perhaps best to refer back to at whatever level, what are the outcomes that we are trying to achieve and what are the things that will stop us achieving those outcomes? So it, our strategic risk register is probably mostly um, a lot of it will be about what are the things that might happen to get in the way of delivering our strategy. Um, at an operational level, it'll be what are the things that will get in the way of us delivering operationally that which we have set out to deliver. And the risks um, are those things that might happen to get in the way. They might also have an issues log, uh, which is the things that have happened or are happening, which are currently getting in the way of that delivery. And those issues will carry their mitigations and their actions to minimise the impact of them as they as they happen. Um, and I think that the maturation of that thinking and the practice of perhaps differentiating between the issues log and the risk log risk register will be important um the biggest principle of all all is probably that you need to focus on the outcomes you wish to achieve or you need to achieve and work back from that as to what are the things that uh, will impact on achieving what you're trying to do OK, thanks. Boyd, have we got any other questions or comments 
on our corporate risk register. Uh, Jerry. It, it, just a very quick one, Sarah, and I'm conscious of what Boyd would just articulate in there in terms of things that, which are already happening, but I would have thought that and it may well be in the next iteration, it's already planned for, so fine. The pause on capital has got to start to feature in this somewhere because we must have had mitigation strategies which were based on those capital projects happening, which are now no longer going to happen. So that, that's, and, and I'm sure it's all, all in hand. Yeah, I think that's a very good point of how it is a dynamic uh, document and a dynamic practice. Um, and um, the lack of money will create a risk that certain objectives will not be achieved. Um, and so the question has to be, uh, how do we register that? Uh, but also what might be the actions or mitigations that could help with those uh, particular circumstances? OK, uh, Richard, I'll bring you in. Yeah, just, just to go back on Jerry's point, uh, we, we do carry a risk, <coughs> Jerry, with that, which we're updating the Scottish Government just now, just waiting to see what, we, what we're going to get in backlog formula allocation. So we've identified the implications of, of the capital projects not going ahead in terms of form, formula capital. So in terms of backlog maintenance, we put a submission into Scottish Government of what those implications are. But I, we, we, are, we have a risk raised about not having enough backlog maintenance funding. Um, yeah, but the risk here that I'm referring to, so if we take Lochaba, backlog maintenance risk does not touch what we were planning to do in Lochaba. So every plan we, or most plans we had round about Lochaba Hospital and services, you, you, you can now bin them for a couple of years at least. So th there's got to be uh, a risk there, not backlog maintenance. There right. may well be enhanced backlog maintenance issues as well, but there must be service issues as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. And I think we, um, uh, Chair, if I can come back on that, um, I think we have to work through how to best uh, capture that because the the ultimate solution um, would be if there were money available, but the um, the working with the, the what, what's now a, a problem, an immediate issue that we can't build the building means that um, provision of services will have to be through old estate rather than through newly provided estate and we'll have to work through how we capture that and what, what that means at different levels uh, of the organisation and its risk registers. So I think it's a point well made but we are um, we will need to work through that uh, and uh, it'll be captured at the various levels where it could have an effect. And I, I wonder if at and we can take this offline, but I'm just wondering if, um, given the the unique kind of sequence of events and the situation we're in with regards to our finances, both the capital and the revenue. Now, I know that we have a, a regular um, you know, process for reviewing and updating our risks, but I wonder if when we get that feedback from the Scottish Government and as a board, we are clear on um, the parameters within which we are able to work in the next year, if, if it would be worth um, reviewing our corporate risks to see if, you know, we've got ones on there around finance and transformation, but I suppose to your point, Boyd, is trying to figure out if that adequately captures the the specific set of risks that we will now face um, once yeah. we have a bit more clarity from the Scottish Government. So we can obviously talk about that offline, but I wonder if that would be a, a natural point at which to to reflect and see if it's still working for us, given the slightly yeah. different circumstances we're operating in. Maybe a helpful example, just before Alec comes in. Um, Clinical Governance Committee is working its way through getting a high level strategic risk, which is effectively about all of the high level, so together we care strategic intent that is about clinical service and caregiving service delivery. And it's trying to capture that there's a risk that we won't achieve all that we intend to in our strategy. And so the risk will be written at the Clinical Governance Committee level to express that there are unknowns that could get in the way of delivering on the services. Now, actually, when you break it down, that will capture what could be hundreds or thousands of separate risks held further down. But it's at a high level expressing that there is a risk that we don't achieve 
uh, what we say we want to achieve in our strategy, which is good clinical services. The same will probably apply to the estates and its national financing situation. That will have an impact in a number of ways, impacts on the deliverables for Richard and his department in terms of estates plans. But it also is a risk to service delivery uh, in terms of the best possible facility that uh, our staff can use to give care to people. So, so it may express in a number of different ways. Um, and at board level, it's about what will allow us to achieve that together we care strategy. And that's the probably the biggest focus for us, um, perhaps as a as a, a met methodology to create um, your, your highest up risk register. Okay, well, yeah, that's a helpful lens to, to think about the question. Um, okay, Alex, I'll bring you in next. Yeah, just to build on what Jerry asked, him, from memory, um, some of the estate, so not all, but some of our estate, um, the regulators and I'm the fire service, the health and safety, etc. All were made promises on, don't worry about this, in two years' time we've got a new X, whatever X is. Now, some of that will have been paused and some of that will be stopped. There must be a risk that the regulator, whichever one it is, turns in and says, no, no, stop, cease, desist. I'm telling you now, you're doing nothing until that's fixed. Now, I'm not saying that will happen, but there's a risk that it could happen. Um, that's the kind of thing I think that, that we need to think about in terms of, of, of the pause, as well as the impact of the, the money. So we've got a, a compliance risk, we've got a reputational risk, we've got a financial risk, all which builds off that one part, as well as the backlog maintenance that, that Richard already mentioned. Thanks. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands, no other questions or comments. So just to recap there, we are being asked to take substantial assurance from the report and examine and consider the evidence. So are members happy with that? Yes, great. Um, and potentially we'll look offline about what the world looks like after we've had some feedback um, and what we want to do after that. OK, good. Uh, great. So uh, next up is item number nine. So I'll be inviting Gareth to speak to this item. This is our whistleblowing standards report for quarter three. So I shall hand over to you, Gareth. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. In line with the reporting requirements under the whistleblowing standards, uh, we produce quarterly reports. I'll take the paper as read in terms of the background uh, related to um, the standards um, and uh, in terms of just highlighting the key points from the last quarter, uh, which went around from the 1st of November to the 31st of uh, January. There have been no new cases raised. One case was closed. Uh, we have no outstanding cases under investigation by the board under the standards during that period. Um, and one monitor at the end of that period and one monitor referral remains under review. Um, and one case arising from an inward query remains under review as well. So there's further details in the paper in relation to those. The case that was closed um, uh, highlighted that the concerns that were raised were upheld uh, in relation to the uh, concern, the whistleblowing concerns, and an action plan has been agreed and shared with the complainant who's content with the outcome of the investigation. So that's been a positive uh, outcome to that investigation. I uh, say so there was uh, two monitored referrals uh, that were received in quarter two, one of which has not progressed uh, and we've not received further um, contact from the indiv individual after uh, deciding not to take forwards under the eligibility criteria for the standards. The second uh, has, we were asked to revisit that after the individual uh, put in a further complaint to the uh, to INWO asking us to look at this again. Uh, I think the key point to emphasise here is that these issues, those issues went back a number of years and we've offered the individual uh, on, a, on at least two occasions an opportunity to meet with us and discuss current concerns and to address them uh, as a significant amount of work has been undertaken over the last uh, 18 months to, and probably beyond that uh, in terms of the area that this person was working within um, that addresses some of the concerns that were most the majority of the concerns that were raised if not all of them um, so there is a um, 
that is still outstanding for the board and we're still in contact with Inwo, um, although contact from the individual has not has tailed off and we don't have any further contact with them at the moment. And so we're waiting to see what happens with that one. Um, <coughs> and we have a, a, a latter one, which is a query around um, a complaint made of a member of staff. We're in ongoing conversations with that individual and we're like and we're currently going to progress that to a formal whistleblowing concern now. Um, uh, following further discussion with the individual, which, which took place in February. Um, and that's that. I shall uh, pause there for questions. Thank you, Gareth. Um, OK, any questions or comments, observations? Uh, Emily, I will bring you in first. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Gareth. Um, I just wanted to understand if we've got any comparative data about the absolute number of cases in other boards. It just seems like it's quite a low number of cases being raised. I know that we do a lot of work around raising awareness of the process, but I just wondered if the number that's coming up is about as expected for boards of our size and complexity. Thank you. Um, that's a good question. Um, I'd have to go and have a look at that. I'm not I, um, off the top of my head. I can't remember whether there is an annual report submitted um, to um, to Inwo. Um, I don't know whether that is made public, but I presume it will be as uh, we're required to publish the report. So we'll need to go back and have a look at that um, in a bit more detail. Um, uh, I think we do have to remember we have the Guardian service as well, which is um, a precursor, if you like, to the whistleblowing standards um, and investigating things under those under those basis, which we have reasonably good uptake at the moment in relation to that. Um, and it's varying, but it's around circa 200 people contact that service per year. Um, okay. but again, that ranges from um, levels of um, concern, I suppose, from moderate through to, to um, you know, I suppose, substantial that would start maybe tipping into the standards. Thank you. That's really helpful context. OK, and um, I have a question about that, but I'll, I'll bring those in first. Uh, I've got Bert and then Anne. So Bert, I'll bring you in now. Just in response to the question about you know benchmarking and the position uh, across the country, so there is an annual report done by every board, um, and um, historically uh, the numbers in Highland have been low. But I think it's fair to say that probably across the country um, the numbers are low. Um, it's difficult to make direct comparisons for a whole host of reasons. Um, but what I can tell you is that in Highland, there is a lot of work goes on to raise awareness about the standards, um, to encourage people to speak up. And the figures that we um, see in, in the report today are, are those concerns which meet, meet the criteria of the standards. Um, so there may well be um, concerns that have been raised and dealt with through business as usual processes, for example, um, or issues that have been raised which do not meet the criteria. So I, I hope that's helpful for you, Emily. Thank you. It is. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Um, and Anne. So <laughs> just uh, again, in terms of further context, and I think, you know, in some it's a, a really challenging issue, I think, um, this one of whether uh, low numbers means that we have low low incidents or whether it means that people aren't reporting. It's almost an impossible question to answer. But um, uh, we did have a, a overall, I would say, a reasonably positive audit report recently on the range of our speak up processes, Gareth. Um, and I think that there were one or two issues raised, but overall, I think that was very positive. But I wondered if you wanted to make any comment about, you know, um, what improvement, if any, that report indicated might be needed. Um, but I think it's just important that if, I'm not sure how uh, everybody's aware that that overall that was a very positive report. Thanks. Um, so I suppose the key the key issues that arose. So again, on the whole, generally positive um, improvements in process, particularly in relation that covered a broader range of of uh, policy areas, including uh, workforce policies. <coughs> so it was 
um, noting the potential improvements around um, the uh, local record keeping because um, uh, in terms of workforce po policies, that was one area. Um, so there were improvements as opposed to saying there were significant uh, worries with the control objectives that the audit uh, was focused on. Um, I think probably if, if I take a step back, then I think if we look at what we're trying to achieve is to ensure that there's a broad range of opportunities for staff to raise concerns through several different um, channels and forums. And where we want to be is that the the majority of these issues are dealt with within business as usual context and speaking to managers following process is in that context. So I think the whistleblowing report, as Bert has said, is relatively no numbers. <clears throat> I think what's more important is thinking about the the outcomes from those reports. So what are the significant if there were any significant learnings we need to take away from those reports uh, in terms of what what might not be working for people to feel that they can raise these concerns um, through normal channels. So again, we spent quite a bit of time as a board looking at so through the pause and reflect. Um, and I think we just need to just be thoughtful about it, it, it is what it is in terms of the range of reporting. We've got a wide range of ways of reporting. We've got the Guardian service, got whistleblowing policies and data also goes through the staff governance committee in relation to um, uh, um, in terms of the workforce policies as well. So um, so I think we provide assurance that we are looking in across a range of indicators and we continue to continue to monitor uh, the overall organization um, for potential trends or signs. But one of the other things that came out of the audit committee was uh, whether we could do that better and in a more informed way. And I think that's really the area where there's a wider discussion to be had about how we triangulate data um, and uh, look at that in relation to both staff governance data and clinical governance data and performance data. Um, so a bit of a long winded answer to saying that I think with the mechanisms are sufficient to um, allow people to report concerns. What we may need to think about is whether we need to do further work to identify areas that might be struggling and how we use triangulation of data to do that. <coughs> Thank you, Gareth um, and Bert, bring you back in. Yeah, I, I guess Gareth has really covered most of what I would have said. Um, yeah, there was the audit, but I think what is also important to highlight is the proactive approach that was taken uh, in relation to the pause and reflect um, about where we are on the journey, how it has been, uh, where we are now and where we are going. And I think that's been a really positive step. Gareth has already said that, um, you know, there are a number of routes um, that people can use to um, raise concerns. And I think that's important. Um, but what is of even greater importance is that people feel able um, to come forward and to raise uh, the concerns appropriately. Um, and, um, you know, there's work to do, there's no question of that, but it's a journey that we're on and um, you, the, the opportunities are there for people to raise their concerns, not just through uh, the whistleblowing process, but through a range of different processes. Thank you. Thank you, Bert, and I'd absolutely like to echo that um, sentiment about the utmost importance is that people feel able to speak up. And, and it's great that we have a variety of ways for them to do that, but but the work will always continue and, and we have to keep, um, keep focused on that. OK, uh, I'm not seeing any other hands up. So uh, we were being asked to take moderate assurance from the report. Um, and note that it gives confidence of compliance with legislation, policy and board objectives. Are we happy to do that? Grant, OK, uh, the next couple of items I'll be asking Ruth to speak to. So we have number 10 next on the agenda. So this is our annual code of corporate governance review. So Ruth, I will hand over to you. OK, thank you very much. Sarah, so yes, as the annual review of the Code of Corporate Governance. Um, the outcome of this review was considered by the Audit Committee earlier this month. And the paper has been prepared together with input from finance colleagues to take account of some of their particular changes to be reflected in the code. So this year there are some 
revisions and updates to the fraud policy and action plan, um, namely to update the contact details, some revisions to standing financial instructions to make sure that it aligns with changes to legislation and make sure that the terminology is consistent with that used with other procedures and guidance and some revisions to our governance committee terms of reference. Um, just so that you know, there are no changes to the clinical governance or the remuneration committee terms of reference, but they're included in the pack just for completeness sake. So the board's invited to approve and take assurance that the updates um, made in the code are appropriate. Um, and note that I will put a totally revised version of the Code of Corporate Governance onto our website after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Any comments or questions on this item? Jerry. It, it was just something that occurred to me this morning, Sarah, when we, when we were talk, talking about money and I, and I, I was scanning through it so again apologies if it's there but pay i'm looking at page 144 of the of the pack which is specifically in the uh the proposed standing financial instructions which i've got good no problems with but again we talk specifically about the commissioning of patient services where we're not talking about we mentioned nowhere about all the commissioning what we do in relation to care homes and care at home and so forth and whatnot, and, where, and whether there needs to be somewhere to include that sort of thing. And again, if it is in there and I've just missed it, apologies. If someone can just point it out to me, that would be fine. Okay. I uh, don't know, Haleth, if you're able to answer that one or if we need to take it away, I'm not sure. I can't see Haleth on the call. Gosh, we've lost her. Okay. We can take that Jerry, away, Jerry. I think we need to take that away, unless Pam, Pam might have magicked up the answer. Pam? No, I think it's a good challenge, and I think we need to take it away. Excellent. Right. Well, we will take that away and find out the answer or make the change if we need to. Any other comments or questions? Okie dokie. Right, so we'll take a note of that. So just then so we've been asked to take substantial assurance note um that we published but we'll we'll update that to reflect the fact that we need to pick up jerry's question and ruth i think we'll need to do that before we publish it just to make sure that we're, we're squared there okay item number 11 this is ruth again so this is our annual board and committee work plans for 2024-25 that's right, yes. Um, so there's um, the suite of board and committee work plans um, in a separate document, an Excel spreadsheet for you this time round. As you know, these work plans cover all of your planned activity, your statutory reporting duties and regular items of business. These work plans have been considered and agreed by your governance committees over the last cycle of meetings and being discussed with chairs and lead executives. So the report highlights that the board and the committee's business is being looked at currently through the lens of frugal governance. So the aim of frugal governance is to reduce duplication and to use committee time as effectively as we possibly can. Um, so we will continue to look at our board work plans um, and should we require to make any changes, we will bring them back for you. Um, but otherwise, at the moment, they are um, good to go as they are at the moment. So you're asked to consider what you have in front of you and endorse the work plans as they are today. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Reason. Thank you for highlighting the um, the work that's going on in the background um, around the frugal governance piece. I was going to pick that up if you if you didn't. So that's good that you highlighted that. Thank you. Any questions or comments about the work plans at this point, bearing in mind that we will look at them a lot more? No, okay, so we've been asked to consider and endorse. Assume everybody is happy with that. So that takes us on to our, uh, all of our various uh, governance and committee assurance reports. So in the order that they are listed in the agenda, I will whiz through. So first up there, 
um, Alex, I'll ask you to come in and speak to the FRP minute of the 9th of February and the draft minute of the 1st of March and anything that you wish to highlight or escalate. No, I see nothing to really to highlight. I mean, obviously the financial position and the challenges therein, we've had a lot of discussion on um, today. And we had an awful lot of discussion on both the, um, the, the January and the, the, sort of the February one and the March one. Um, the issue with Highland Council is also something that we've been discussing uh, at depth uh, and trying to find how we can work constructively with them and, and help there. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically where we, where we are. And the challenge um, clearly is to uh, to address the financial position as we go forward. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And, and just I'm sure everybody knows, but just to point out that we are continuing to have our FRP or Alex is continuing to have his FRP meetings monthly. I think our next one's the 12th of April or something like that, isn't it? Something. Yeah. OK. Any questions or comments for Alex or, or around FRP? No. OK, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have the Highland Health and Social Care Committee draft minute of the 6th of March. I'll invite Jerry and, and again, anything you want to highlight or bring to the board's attention? Uh as previously mentioned, uh, Sarah, really just to draw board's attention to, not escalate, but just draw board's attention to the, the work programme associated with the vaccination transformation programme. And, and, and we're only drawing it to the attention because of, I think of the, the volume of work and the, and, the, and the relatively short time scale if we have to have something uh, in place for the, for the winter programme uh, ahead. So that, that, that was really... Uh, where we were because we've got quite a fundamental change in the model there and there's some underpinning clinical governance issues which I know Alistair uh, is picking up as well and the other I think the other highlight of the the committee meeting was uh, Tim's presentation on the the public health report which has always stimulated a lot of really excellent discussion in terms of how we make sure this is getting incorporated into our service planning and our service delivery thank you Sarah thank you Jerry Thanks, Jerry. Uh, any questions or comments for Jerry around Highland Health and Social Care Committee? No, okay, good, thank you. Uh, that moves us on then to Clinical Governance Committee. I will invite Alistair. It was a fairly uh, re routine meeting. There was two two issues, one of which I've mentioned earlier on, uh, which is the position with NDAS, and we covered that earlier on in this meeting. And we also had a very uh, interesting discussion about clinical risk uh, at a strategic level, so whereby uh, really uh, multitude of factors could impact our, our, our clinical performance and clinical risk. Um, and it was agreed to hold a, a board wide workshop uh, on that to explore that further. And I think they're really, Sarah, the, the, the notable points to, to report back on. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, any questions? for Alistair around Clinical Governance Committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will move us on then to Area Clinical Forum and Katrina, I will invite you to speak to that one, please. Thank you. Um, I don't have a lot to add. Um, our biggest um, update was, our topic was really an update on general dental services, which we'd asked for. Um, which was very well received and um, very interesting update for us. Um, and also, I suppose to reassure you that the we haven't had any meetings from the psychological services team for several months now, but we are hoping to have a representative from that group at our development day as well, because we do feel it is a really key group of people to be involved. Um, and we're hopeful that they will have um, their uh, committee, uh, advisory committee up and running again um, this year. So we are looking forward to having their input yet again. And the other challenge, I think, was the um, Healthcare Sciences um, Committee, which is uh, a, another group in, enjoying a great deal of challenge at the moment as to how they operate and get people together. Um, so we're just supporting them as much as possible and they're attending as much as as they can, when they can, uh, a bit ad hoc, but at least we get their input as much as is realistically possible at the moment. But happy to take any questions. 
Thank you, Katrina. That's really helpful to understand that. Um, OK, do we have uh, questions or comments for Katrina or anything around ACF? And obviously, some we come to ACF, the non execs come on a, on a rotating basis, which is really, really helpful for us to see that as well. Great. OK, not seeing anybody coming in there, so I'll move us on. Next, I've got Staff Governance Committee, and that was a draft minute of the 5th of March. I will invite Anne to speak to this one, please. So, um, well, I, I hopefully, uh, Board members will take some assurance from the fact that uh, the committee considered a number of the issues that were raised earlier under the IPQR uh, report. And in relation to um, appraisals and PDPs, we had obviously the detail of the improvement plan that has, is being put in place. Um, so it was great to be able to see and uh, endorse that. And I think the other most significant discussion was around the Health and Care Staffing Act. Um, and I'd just like to uh, draw members' attention to one of the sort of particular issues for, for our board uh, being the, I suppose, how, how we implement uh, the Act uh, in terms of the responsibilities of both the Council and ourselves in relation to social care staff. So, I think those were the most uh, the, the key discussions and happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. Any questions or comments around the staff governance report? No, OK, thank you. Uh, that moves us on then to the Argyll and Butte Integration Joint Board. Always a tricky one because it happens the day after board. But um, Graham, I will invite you in to speak to that one, please. Yes, indeed. Um, two months ago now, um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I think I'm correct in saying um, that at that point uh, Evan hadn't been um, appointed as uh, our uh, interim um, chief executive. So I, I welcome to Evan, who uh, I know is on the call here today, um, and uh, I'm sure he feels now as if he's. Uh, been in place for years in the same way that Fiona will feel that uh, she's been um, kind of with you, Pam, for a, lo a long time as well. So um, time flies when you're enjoying yourself. Um, so um, main point uh, really over these last, uh, at our last meeting was trying to ensure that uh, we come in and budget and uh, so thanks to all who have uh, done such a good job and uh, bringing us so close to it um, well done to everyone and uh, no doubt I'll get fresh updates tomorrow thank you absolutely thank you Graham any questions or comments for the IGB okay you've you've briefed us well Graham thank you uh, and last but not least I have audit committee um draft minute of the 12th of March so not so long ago I will invite Gaynor to speak to this one please thank you um so a couple of things to flag there's been a bit of slippage in our internal audits um and uh, slippage in terms of closing off the recommended management actions so I think Pam has picked this up with with the DG following our our, our meeting um I'm also going to meet with internal audit in April to review the progress before we meet in the, at our May meeting in case we have to extend our May meeting to pick up on um, some points. But we were given some reassurance at the uh, at, at the meeting a, a couple of weeks ago um, that actually there were a number of um, there were a number of management actions that, that um, probably had been closed off. They just didn't had they just didn't had yet been run by um, internal audit. Um, so we so we have our meeting in May and we've also had to schedule an, an extra meeting in June um, so that we can look at um, internal audit reports that have slipped um, before we meet to sign off um, our annual accounts towards the end of June. So um, hopefully things will uh, improve over the next couple of months in terms of closing off those recommendations and in terms of being able to catch up a bit on that slippage. Um, but that's all I've got to report. Thanks. 
Thank you, Gainer. Um, okay, any questions or comments for Gainer or around the audit committee? No, okay, and obviously we will um, watch closely as to how that progresses, Gainer. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, right, so that brings us to the end of those various minutes. So we're being asked to confirm that adequate assurance has been provided from our governance committees and note the minutes and actions um, from the ACF and the IGB. Are we happy to do that? Fantastic. Okay. Does anybody have any other competent business they wish to raise? Nope. Uh, so before I get to the very last bit, because anybody's hovering over the leave button, can I please remind everybody that we have um, another meeting to go into um, pretty much straight after this, just in case anybody thinks that they're they're done with their meetings for the day. You are not. Uh, we have a, a trustees of the endowment fund meeting and it's in a separate invite. So I just thought I'd say that now before people um, get a bit click happy with the leave button. Um, the next date and time of this meeting of the board is on the 28th of May. We will see you then, but I'll see you in the next room. Thank you very much for your time, everybody, today. Don't be too upset, Pam. Thanks, Jack.